Okay. Um, so this is the introductory lecture for Lab 1, 50344, um, Section 3, because we missed because we missed our um, lab due to inclement weather, uh, and I couldn't get everyone at one place at one time. I'm doing this uh, really, really rushed um, sort of a podcast deal where I could go over this introductory PowerPoint so that everyone's sort of on page before we start lab two. And so uh, my apologies first off if I screw up a few things, but um, I'm gonna try to do this as carefully and thorough as possible so that when we do meet up um, for lab two, you guys will be prepared with, uh, with material that was covered and you're responsible for, for lab one. All right, so lab one is about ancestral chordate taxa. Um, briefly, I will discuss um, some major concepts, some shared traits, and a description of the major groups that are included in this PowerPoint and also in today's lab. Okay, so just to set the context, this is um, a phylogeny of the major groups, uh, one outgroup over here, the echinoderms, which include the sea stars and sea urchins, and the chordates, which is the topic, of the topic of pretty much the rest of this course. And there's another group here included called the hemichordates that traditionally have been placed in with the chordates because of the possession of one trait, uh, namely, however, based on some fossil and molecular work, um, some recent fossil and molecular work, hemichordates seem to actually belong more closer to the echinoderms, forming a separate and distinct clade from the chordates. But I've played, but the hemichordates are included here just so that um, it provides um, sort of historical context and for so that it could be a little bit more comprehensive in terms of how how this tree of life was originally formed uh, or are conceived. Uh, within chordates are three major groups: the urochordates, the cephalochordates, and the vertebrates. Um, the urochordates include two major groups um, that you will see in the lab. One are the tunicates, or the sea squirts, and also the larvaceans, or the house builders. And cephalochordates are, are a pretty uniform group, and the major uh, species that will represent this group is um, from the genus Branchiostoma, and the common name of the organism is the lancelet or amphioxus. And then vertebrates, pretty self-explanatory. They are animals that, that have a Vertebrae, a vert, have vertebrae and a spinal column with one exception, and I'll go into that later in the PowerPoint. Okay, so first off, hemichordates. These are the hemichordates. This is what they look like. The common name for these guys are the acorn worms, acorn worms. And um, general feature is it has a proboscis, it has a mouth, it has a structure here called the collar, and then the rest of this body called the trunk and the anus is back here. All along the body are um, pharyngeal pores. They're slits, and basically they're used to uh, control water flow out, and it probably regulates other sorts of functions um, that are associated with, with needing water to flow through, through the mouth and across the body. Um, these, these animals have over 150 pairs of these slits on either side of the trunk. And um, other details, let's see. For now, this is, this is all you really need to know. Um, so this, these are the hemichordates. Okay. Moving on, phylum chordata, the defining characteristics or um, unifying characteristics, also called synapomorphies, of this group are these four characters. The presence of a notochord, which is a stiff rod like structure that supports um, that supports these organisms. Um, initially, the ancestral forms use the notochord as a structural support through their entire lives. Um, this this structure is lost in more derived taxa, um, and uh, in most in in most vertebrates, it actually becomes uh, a remnant structure that's found in between different um, vertebrae but uh, all vertebrates have this structure, <clears throat> or at least remnants of this structure during development. A dorsal hollow nerve cord, 
basically a spinal column um, with uh, in some in more derived taxa there's an anterior specialized region called the brain an endostyle which is an organ that secretes mucus in ancient taxa but then it actually metamorphoses into the thyroid in the lamprey and then in all other more derived vertebrates uh, the form in which the state in which you see this structure is predominantly the thyroid uh, post anal tail pretty self-explanatory beyond the anus there's a tail all right just so um, everyone understands uh, these are basic orientation uh, planes just for reference I will be using the term dorsal to describe the back of the animal um, the laterals are to the left and right and if ever there is an image that's a cross section those synonym for that is transverse section. Um, this is how you would typically see cross sections. Okay? The rotation changes slightly for, for bipedal organisms like humans. All right, moving on. So what is a notochord? Notochord is dorsal to the body cavity, but ventral to the dorsal hollow nerve cord. It's composed of a core of cells and fluid encased in tough sheet of fibrous tissue. Um, what's structurally pretty neat about this structure is that it can't be compressed from an anterior-posterior um, orientation. However, it, it can, um, it is uh, laterally, laterally flexible. And so this is important because if you're an organism that's living in water and chordates life, life <clears throat> for chordates, life began in the water, um, if you're moving through a viscous medium like water, you don't want to have your longitudinal axis compressed. Um, the lateral flexibility allows for locomotion. And <clears throat> in more derived taxa, you could have muscles that, that support the notochord. And so that when muscles contract, and along with this, this sort of in, uh, built-in ability for a lateral flexibility, you can have a greater thrust and, uh, pro and with the placement of fins, you can have more controlled locomotion. And so the neat thing about the notochord, again, is it provides a stiff structure in the face of a viscous medium, but it also allows this lateral flexibility for that organism to, to be moved. Towards the hollow nerve cord, um, it's hollow, as the name suggests. Uh, it's located dorsal to the gut and the notochord, and it's hollow. Uh, it's formed through a process called evagination. Um, other major points to mention uh, is that compared to solid nerve cords that other animals have, um, there's really no functional advantage between this and the dorsal hollow nerve cord. And the dorsal hollow nerve cord is found in chordates. An endostyle. So an endostyle <clears throat> is a mucus secreting gland found in the pharynx. Uh, in, in, in taxa with a lot of ancient traits, so the less derived taxa, uh, mostly the invertebrate chordates, the mucus is used to trap food during filter feeding. Now, in lamprey, which are, um, which are a less derived vertebrate, but they have more derived features than invertebrate chordates, the larvae of the lamprey, called the amacetes, actually has an endostyle, but during its development, it changes into a thyroid. The thyroid is, is, is a gland that you see in vertebrates that are as derived or more derived than the lamprey. And uh, even, though, even though you might not see an endostyle during development of some vertebrate taxa, um, you always see a thyroid in, in the more derived ones. So the presence of a thyroid is the same thing as the presence of an endostyle. And that's why it's a characteristic that defines chordates. Postanal tail, somatic tissue, um, and it extends beyond the anus. And it provides more attachment for muscles um, as well as greater surface for pushing against water. So it provides, it assists in, in achieving greater locomotive abilities or capabilities.